Hello, everyone, and welcome to First Draft Friday, episode number 67. Today, we are going to be talking with author Jane L. Rosen about her journey from screenwriter to published author. I am so excited to talk about this topic. We're also going to be talking about ways that you can apply screenwriting ideas or um, principles in your own writing. And welcome, Jane. It's so great to have you here. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you, Alessandra. I am Jane Elverson. I am a screenwriter turned novelist. I'm about to turn in my fifth novel next week. Um, and I'm here to discuss the transition between screenwriting and novel writing and the similarities and the differences and any questions that you have. And, and you have a new release um, on Fire Island. And I have to say, I read those synopsis and I love this. It says, uh, it's a love story of sorts about a book editor, Julia, who falls in love with and marries an author, Ben. But what makes this story different is that Julia is dead. And I immediately was like, well, I, ha I have to know more. Like that's, that's all I needed. All I needed to know. Can you tell us just a little bit about On Fire Island? I can, I can. It's a story that has originally was written as a screenplay that I literally wrote four books so that I could, three books so that I could this one well, because the story means so much to me. And it sounds sad because Julia's dead, but it's not at all sad. It's funny, it's hopeful, it's uplifting. It's the story of her last summer on Fire Island after she passes away, watching her husband and her friends go on without her. And it just has really inspired people in many ways and the reviews have been fantastic and I'm really proud of it. I love that. So this is so interesting. So you originally wrote this as a screenplay. How, how long ago did you write that screenplay? So I wrote the screenplay probably 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was actually with Hart, with um, Weinstein when mm -hmm. everything imploded with him. Um, and then I started writing novels. Now, the reason I started writing novels is really because I sold screenplays before, but I never had anything made. And I was really tired of just mm -hmm having my family and whoever I sold <laughs> this screenplay to read my work. And I just wanted to try something different. And I noticed that so many novels were being made into television shows or into movies. So I said, I'm gonna try this a different way. I can't imagine the, I don't wanna say anguish, but the disappointment in creating a story, creating a screenplay and then no one ever reading or seeing that. I mean, that's to me, one of the joys of, of being an author is like putting the work out there in the world and reading reviews and hearing from readers and that sort of thing. So yeah, I can understand how that would be, that would be hard. Do you, have you thought about adapting other screenplays you've written to book form? You know, that's such a good question. Cause I had one script that I had written and sold so many times that I really should one day do but, but I'm like, I mean, life is long. So I, I hope that one day, um, yeah, I do think about it, but I'm on this roll of different stories and it's been great. And I really like the novel writing process. And I really love working with one editor as opposed to a zillion different people in Hollywood. So it's been very satisfying for me. I would also imagine in Hollywood, just the brief experience that I've had with it it's so many different opinions, right? So like one person reads a script and wants these changes and then someone else wants these other changes. And it's very, I always felt whenever I was dealing with a script in Hollywood, uh, it, it never felt like it was mine. Like it was- It's not you know, yours. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, like they would like, oh, maybe take my opinions into consideration, but for the most part, like, yeah, it was- Yeah, I mean, it's literally it. not yours they say, like they option it, right? So when you sell a book, you sell your book and it is yours. So yes, the editor will suggest this and that, but they always preface it with, it's yours. Yeah. You, you pick the cover with them. You pick the font, the title, so many things. In Hollywood, if they say, we bought this from you and now we'd like you to move it from Fire Island to Mars, <laughs> you better move it to Mars or they're gonna yeah. fire you know, the next day and find someone that'll move it to Mars. So it's a much different experience. It is, that is so interesting. So how did you get into screenwriting? Did you have a writing background or what was like, 
how did you get there to begin with? I was my, my youngest or my oldest or somebody was a nurse starting nursery school. And it was the 92nd Street Y Nursery School, which is in Manhattan. And I was pretty young at the time. I was a young mom. And it was a real scene that I had never seen before. And I just thought, this is a movie. This is a movie. So I literally took a class, a Gotham Writers Workshop. On you know They're online now. Then I went in person for 10 weeks. And I learned how to write a script. I wrote the script. And believe it or not, I sold it to Miramax. I met a producer in my older daughter's school. She's like, let me read it. She read it. She sold it to Miramax. It was so simple that I really thought that this was this easy. Hurt. And then I pulled <laughs> very quickly on the fact that it wasn't. I mean, especially the funniest thing that happened. They, they would, I don't want to put everyone down, but hopefully they're not watching. <laughs> they say things like, we love this script, but could you have them meet when they're young? I'm like, okay. So I'd rewrite it and have the couple, it was a romantic comedy, meet when they're young. And then I turned it in a couple of weeks later and they would they would say, we love this script, but could you have them? <laughs> I'm like, okay, do that. And turn in the, the old script, basically. <laughs> and it was like this for so long that I just, it was crazy. Like. When you watch, and then they fired me. Eventually, I wrote, I rewrote it like 30 times. And my lawyer called me one day and he said, I was just on the phone with the lawyer at Miramax. And he said, you're the best screenwriter at the studio right now. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous. I, I, how could I be, you know, whatever I said. Next day he called me, he's like, Jane, I'm sorry they fired you. I'm like, what? Yes, I'm the best screenwriter. He said, that's what happened. You were so good. They had to let you go. That was it. <laughs> because people don't realize, like, if you look at the movie Tootsie and there's like 10 screenwriters in the credits and you have this feeling like they're all sitting around a big table writing the script together, all like kumbaya. No, like one was fired, replaced with the next 10 times. And that is what you're seeing. And somehow... Tootsie turned out to be an amazing movie, but usually it messes things up pretty well. I could see that 100%. So when you decided to write your first novel, now when you with, with screenwriting, you took a class, like you said, a 10-week course. So did mm -hmm. you do anything similar to that when you transitioned to writing a novel, or did you I, just jump in? I just jumped in. I mean, screenwriting is a very specific talent. You really kind of have to learn even how to set it up, you know? Yeah. Like, how, right, how to introduce a yeah, yeah, talent and not a talent, it's really a learned structure. I think it's not your usual way of writing. I mean, you could get final draft or something like that, which I did, of course, to help me structure my screenplays. But yeah, I needed to know how to do it. But writing a novel, I mean, I wish I went to like an MFA program and did all that, but I didn't. So I just wrote it. And I think majority of us didn't. So it's yeah. all, it's all yeah. good. Um, it, but I, you had that background from screenwriting. So um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying something else. That's okay. I was just going to explain how I decided to write my first yeah. novel screenplay, um, which kind of follows your last question. So I was at uh, Kennedy Airport, I guess it was like seven, eight years ago. 2015 maybe and um you know when people tell you ideas all the time i have a great idea for a story blah, blah, blah. so this and usually i'm like don't tell me i'm gonna take it whatever and then this woman said to me i have a great idea i heard a great story that would make a great movie she said my friend worked at bloomingdale's in the 80s and the dress was returned there with formaldehyde on it covered in formaldehyde and i was like wow like the minute Said it to me, my mind just started churning. Like, what happened to that dress? And I wrote nine women, one dress, and it's all from Bloomingdale's. It's about one dress of Bloomingdale's. I went backwards through nine different women that wore the same dress, ending, of course, in the formaldehyde situation. Yeah. And the reason I wrote it as a book was because I was tired of writing screenplays. I knew it was a movie because it. Mm -hmm. In my head, it was a movie, but I'm like, I'm going to write this as a book and then make it into a movie. 
And I did. And I miraculously sold that first novel. I had agents like, I kind of sold it before I got an agent of, you know, a publishing agent. Um, but once, once that happened, I had so many agents that wanted to represent it and I sold it and it was very successful and it was bought to make a film and it, it was never made, but point being, you know, tons of people read it. And one day I think it will be a TV show or a film. I really do. Cause it was just fantastic. I loved it. I mean, I hate to say that about my own work, but it was a really yeah. story. If you that can't love it then, you know, um, so when you say, when you think of, about a book that would make a great movie, what are the elements of that book? Like, what are you thinking about when you're writing the book that would help it in the chance of it being an option? or it being made into a movie? Like, are you are you limiting the number of locations or are you hitting specific beats at a specific pace? Or are there any are there any kind of rules that you're trying to follow that would increase the chance of that book's success on film? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think it's a, um, a lot of dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of fun locations, a cinematic experience, like for example, nine women, one dress. I, if you saw, I'm sure you saw like Love Actually. Yeah. Right. With all the different characters and stories all wound up into one, or any of those movies. Uh, what was it? Valentine's Day or New Year's Eve? The, the the you know the Rob Marshall. Right. Yeah. So, is that his name? No, Penny's brother. What's his name? Is it Rob? No. Um, I don't know, but I know what you're talking about. Where you know, you've got four different storylines or nine different storylines, yeah. and then they're they're all connected at some point. Exactly. So I, I knew that like this would be the perfect film. It was set in New York City. It was set, you know, going from like the fall through Christmas. It had the characters. It had actresses that wouldn't have and actors that wouldn't have to work that long because they were only in certain parts it just had some great elements for a feel-good movie and i you know that's it's the cinematic way of seeing things i think i see things as a film and why nine women that's a lot of women like I mean, was there a time where you were thinking about six or you know what? It's so weird how things work out. I really, I named it first Nine Lives of a Little Black Dress. And that uh -huh. is really the truth why there's nine women. Oh, okay. Which <laughs> makes no sense, but that's why it happened. Um, so you've had, you know, it's hard to, I mean, you have a, a big traditional publisher. You've had traditional book deals. You didn't have to query a bunch. Um, in order to get those. Um, so you've really found fast success. And I and I would assume that one of the reasons is because your books are so well grounded in the same things that make a, you know, we all love to watch movies. Um, so I'm curious to know how much of what you learned in screenwriting translates over. So like when you wrote On Fire Island, um, and you look at beginning that book, I don't know what the opening scene is of that book, but did you think of it from a screenwriting perspective of how would this movie begin? And that's where you, where you started out or how how typically does a movie need to begin in order you know, to be okay, enjoyed? For, just so you know, I did not have instant success. I tried first to write children's books and I think I got like 50 rejections. And it also was so hard, even when I sold my script, my first script, I still didn't land an agent and my lawyer had to do everything for me. So it was a long road. Mm -hmm. So if you're on that long road right now, my and my advice is just keep trying. Keep going. Okay. The second question, the script versus the script, I wrote a script for Fire Island first. A script is like 90 pages. A book is 300 something pages. Um, I always like to open with a big bang that would be cinematic or interesting to a reader. Either way, mm -hmm. I try and um, I try and keep like my screenwriting philosophy of moving things along, of one act and two acts and three acts, but the novel is just stretched out with more description and more inner thought. I love the inner thought part of writing a novel 
as opposed to- you don't to, get that. No, you don't yeah. get that. You have to really put it in there in a different way. It's trickier. Yeah, so do you write in first person then in your novels or third person? I mix it up. Depends on the novel. Yeah. I keep going back to 911 Dress, but as my first novel, every chapter was, there was like 17 different narrators in that book. Wow. Yeah. A lot of different voices. For a first time novelist, that can be hard. It was more with you. Because it was, think about a screenplay, you're writing people's voices, right? Yeah. So in On Fire Island, which was really the story of three men, and one summer when it was a screenplay, I made it, uh, my editor asked me to make it for a female audience and I ended up narrating it from his dead wife's voice, Julia. So Julia tells the story completely throughout the whole book, which is also tough because you couldn't really get into everyone else's heads. You had to show it in a different way or you had to show her perspective as to what she thought they were feeling. It was very interesting. Okay, so she, um when she is deceased she can watch things but she can't hear in her thoughts is she could hear her thoughts in the end she could understand everything that her husband is feeling and yeah. think but that's about it okay. and it's not like a ghost kind of book at all it's basically julia gets she could go with her nana to heaven or she could take one last summer sure fire island although she doesn't really know when she's going to get to leave and she sees her husband's having such a hard time, so she goes with him. Yeah. But as I said, it's not sad. It's it's funny. People, I mean, people definitely said they needed a couple of tissues. I mean, she is sad and he does there's a beautiful love story, but there's a lot of laughs. So was there anything you struggled with when you made that transition in terms of life because you hadn't necessarily written descriptions and I mean you you write descriptions in your screenplay but you're not writing them to be read by a reader you know it's it's written for a director or something else so um was that did you struggle with anything in your transition the reason I really didn't struggle is because of I love Fire Island so much that I found it really um heartwarming to be able to write the descriptions mm -hmm. like is I, Fire Island a real place Yes, it's where I live. I live in New York City and Fire Island. I'm I'm in a I'm in the Catskills right now at a <laughs> but I live in New York City and in Fire Island. And it is a real place. It's an hour from Manhattan by car and then a half an hour ferry ride. It's a car oh. it's a car with no cars on it. Uh -huh. Get off the ferry and you get your little wagon that's tied up at the ferry and you bring your stuff to your house. And I've lived there for 30 years. I met my husband there. Um, some of my best friends in the world are there and it's a very unique place and I was very excited to describe it in any way and every way and the people on the place and what it looks like and what it feels like and what it smells like all was a big thrill for me. So I was happy to do it. And you lived there full time on an island yeah. with no cars or this is a vacation spot? It's I lived there mostly for the summers okay. like July and August. Uh -huh. Winter, my house isn't even like, there's no water. We turn the water off in November. Yeah. Now there are some people that live there full time, but very few. Oh, that's so interesting. I always love the idea of um, like, we've have a, I live in Florida. We have a couple of islands that you have to take a ferry to and don't have cars. And I've always wanted to put like a murder mystery there because it is just such a different dynamic, you know, and when storms come and things like that, you know, there's no communications, there's no, you're really kind of isolated out there and, and the community has to come together and you have to have good neighbors and, you know, um, cause you all depend on each other. So I, I can see it being a really interesting place. Yeah. When hurricane Sandy came, anyone that stayed, the, the police, which is like two people, came to everyone's house and made them sharpie their social security numbers on their arms. In case they... Yeah, like they wanted everyone to leave. I don't know if it was a scare tactic or what. But once someone came to me with a sharpie, I'd be like, I'm out of here. That's too scary. <laughs> I left, obviously. But yeah. Um, that is so funny because we have hurricanes all the time and no one's ever had us do that. It, it does sound like kind of a scare tactic. They're like, we're going to get all these, um, all these people out of here. That's so interesting. Well, the island was decimated and you couldn't, you can't get out. Like, it's not like Florida. You, you really can't. 
And once those ferries aren't running, you're there. That's it. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're gone. Um, so all of your books so far, are they all women's fiction? Yes. Okay. I mean, everyone, men love On Fire Island. So, you know, that's, I mean, it's filled with baseball games. And as I said, there's three male protagonists in it. There's a young kid who's 16 who has like a coming of age story. There's Julia's husband, Ben, the writer, who's about 38. And then there's an older man, Shep, who takes Ben under his wing for the summer, who is the funniest man. So men have been loving the story as well. So when you talk, you mentioned like the act structure. So do you follow a three act structure with screenwriting? You know, I do more in my head. I do more because I'm trained that way. It's not like I'm not one of those writers that like maps everything out and, you know, outlines everything perfectly. And it, it just seems to always come out that way with me, though. Like each character ends up having some kind of three act structure, even if they're the smaller ones or the bigger ones. It always just in my head, I think it's just how I think. I think like a screenwriter. So every character has their own three act structure. You know, not everyone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, we have some comments from the audience. Um, Kit on YouTube says, I'm stealing that Sharpie detail. Um, <laughs> we're going to see that pop up. You're going to have to wrestle that Sharpie out of my hands first. <laughs> Um, from Facebook, someone asked, um, are the scenes in the book on Fire Island the same as script form? So did you use the script as an outline or? I did use the script as a giant outline. And even though there was so much added because it was coming from Julia's perspective, it was very helpful. I had, I worked so hard on that script, especially the dialogue. I would sit at the baseball games in on Fire Island and listen to these old guys talk baseball, like endlessly so i got to use so much of the dialogue that i had worked on for years you know and put it in so i did use it as a big outline it was the biggest outline i've ever had in my life <laughs> it was 90 page outline but um yeah it, it was great so and do you were you pretty much scene by scene or when you move to novel form do you add additional scenes because you don't have to worry so much about every minute of screen time or does that help you keep the book tight i added Okay, I added some backstories. Like my editor wanted me to add a very close female relationship to Julia, which wasn't in the script. So there's this, her best friend across the street, Renee, has an entire storyline. Um, she's divorced, she gets divorced. The husband, sorry, everyone's texting me. Her husband um, leaves her for his assistant. Like very, you know, standard nonsense stuff. But following her story was complete, that whole storyline was completely added in. And it really added to the book. I happen to love that storyline. So there were things like that, you know? I love that. Um, Elaine from YouTube says, coming from screenplay writing, do you think you're more comfortable with showing um, visual action than most novelists? No. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's so funny. I wish I was, but I, Okay, I am more comfortable showing, but sometimes I tend to just tell. So I don't know, like, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> you know, I read too many um, Amazon reviews, which have been like a 4.5 solid for this book, which I'm proud of. But then once in a while, someone will say something about showing and telling. And I don't know why I read the negative things, but I do. Um, so I've read a lot of scripts and some screenwriters are very... Um, they put a lot of action in there. I mean, they really are like hand in on this, you know, she picks up the coffee cup and whatever. And other screen uh, scripts are much more bare bones. I mean, they leave that up to the director. So I'm curious as a screenwriter, where you kind of fell, did you use a lot of visual action in your scripts or did you focus more just on dialogue and on, on the uh set? So sorry, I'm getting my my family is texting. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, please, you're popular. It's good. Um, <laughs> coming down. Um, I am a very short description person when I write a screenplay. I am like, just give it to the people that are setting up the room. Like, if this was about us talking, I would say Alessandra and Jane are talking on Zoom or whatever we're talking on. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't say what we're wearing. I wouldn't say much of anything unless it was like very important to the script. So I'm more basic because it's like, 
you don't want to waste your pages. You know, you have 90 pages. I'm not wasting it describing what your hair looks like. Let the yeah. hair decide that. Yeah. So I could see, because that's what, moving back to Elaine's question, um, if you don't, if you aren't accustomed to doing that a lot, I would think that would also be a transition point into novels is like how much, when I read my early novels, I had very little description of anything. Like, you know, I mean, I'd have, I would have characters carry on conversations and they could be in any room in the house. Like, I mean, you just didn't know. And I've noticed as time goes on, I put in more and more kind of trying to create more scene building. Um, so I know you said the settings were so, so visual at, um, at Fire Island. Um, so that, that seems like something you really embraced. Well, yes, then, but this is my fourth, right? So on my first, Nine Women, One Dress, my editor at the time was like, please describe the room. Like those were a lot of my notes. Yeah. Cause I didn't think to say, describe someone's apartment briefly. Yeah, right. I had to like learn that, you know, learn to add that in. Yeah. Which I, I still don't overly do it. I honestly, I don't, I hate when you're reading a book and it's like three pages on what something looks like. I'm like, oh, please get on to the dialogue <laughs> and the action. So, you know, that's my style and I'm sticking with it. And I love, um, cause you said dialogue is a big part and dialogue is a big carryover from screenwriting. And when you mentioned that you're at the baseball field, so do you have any tips for someone who struggles with dialogue? Do you have any tips? It was interesting what you said, you actually listen to conversations and would you write down little snippets that they would say or? Yes, but this is a very specific thing. I mean, once in a while, my husband will crack up. I'll be on my bicycle in Fire Island and we'll be going in one direction and I'll hear someone talking like something really interesting and I'll like follow that person. He'll be like, where did you go? I'm like, I had to hear what they were saying. But yeah, I really only did that for baseball. Like I'm not an old man playing baseball. You know what I mean? There's like all these 60 year olds playing baseball at Fire Island. So I'm never going to say, oh, it's a moonshot over the bush. Like, what is that even? Mean? So yes, for those things, I wrote it down. It was kind of like research. I mean, I do a lot of research in my books, but this is like in your face kind of research. And in movies, like every, every minute is so expensive. So did that teach you to kind of jump into dialogue? Do you jump into dialogue scenes right mm -hmm. in the beat of the action? Or how do you decide when to start and when to end those conversations? Oh, I try and jump like someone taught me early on. You don't, if someone drives up to a house, they lock, you know, they pull up, they get out of the car, they lock the car, they walk to the front door and they ring the bell. You don't need to know any of that. You know, start when someone opens the door. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the way I do it. Yeah. I'm like, really going on internally in someone's mind in a book, you know, that's the difference. That's right. that internal thought. Right. Absolutely. Well, we are already out of time. It's been a fantastic chat. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much to everyone who chimed in with your questions. We're in our final minute. If you have something quick, now's the time to say it. Otherwise, um, if they're interested in reading On Fire Island or any of your other books, where can they find out more about you? Look, follow me on Instagram, Jane Elvers, and you could see everything there. I'm mostly on Instagram. I have a website and all that other stuff, but I have four books, Nine Women, One Dress, Eliza Starts a Rumor, which is being made into a TV show as we speak. Well, not as we speak because there's a strike, a shoe story, and On Fire Island. So please check it out, any of them, all of them. <laughs> any and all of them. Fantastic. And, um, we're getting a lot of really nice comments. Thank you so much. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, and so thank you for your time and information. And for everyone watching, we will be back in another two weeks with another First Draft Friday. And if you haven't swung by authors.ai, swing by and check out Marlo. She's our artificial intelligence that can critique your novel in just a few minutes. And um, we'd love for you to give her a try. Thanks again, Jane. Thank you again to the audience. We'll see you all in two weeks.